So uh, on Friday, we were looking at uh, Romans chapter 8. We, uh, we came right up to verse uh, 16. So Paul in this verses is, uh, is talking about the whole dimension of the life and the work uh, of the Holy Spirit. Uh, he's talking about the life and the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of uh, believers. Uh, he's explaining to us the work of the Spirit uh, in our lives. Um, and he says that the Holy Spirit in us is the life-giving Spirit. Uh, he sets us free from the law of sin and death. And uh, he talks about this law of sin and death uh, in chapter 7, uh, when he says that sin, uh, the law of sin is a sin that controls the members of our body. And, uh, and the law of death is the byproduct of the sin that is reigning in our uh, bodies. Okay, So we see that the Holy Spirit sets us free from the law of sin and death. However, Paul uh, continues to say that we need to be spiritually minded and not carnally minded, which we looked at in the previous class. It says if we are spiritually minded, it will result in life and peace. But if we are carnally minded, it will result in death. And then he mentions uh, that the Holy Spirit indwelling in the believer, you know, helps um, uh, each one of us to put to death the sinful deeds of the body. So with the help of the Holy Spirit, we should be able to subdue sin and the sinful deeds of the body. And in verse, four, uh, sorry, in verse 16 and 17, he says, everyone who's a child of God, uh, you know, all of us who are believers, and sons and daughters of God, we are children of God. So all of us who are children of God are led by the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Okay, and he also says that we're not only led by the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So, what is uh, if somebody asks us for our birth certificate, we show them Romans chapter eight verse seventeen, where he says the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So, we, if we are children, we have this wonderful uh, privilege of being heirs of God and joint heirs with. Christ. Okay. Then we began looking at uh, verse 17 um, and says, and if uh, Paul writes and says, if children then hairs, hairs of God, and joint hairs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So here he says, and if children you know, it's actually putting us in a very esteemed and in an honorable position uh, that we are hairs, hairs of God and joint hairs with Christ. And he's using kingdom th terminology here that, you know, we are uh, hairs, we are successors of this uh, kingdom. And this is who we are. Who are we? We are, you know, hairs of God, joint hairs with Christ. We share everything with Christ. Okay, even as we share all of the blessings, the privileges uh, that, uh, you know, that uh, Paul lists for us in Romans chapter 5, 6, and 7, you know, all that he conveyed to us in chapters 5, 6, and 7 that we have received as a result of what Christ has accomplished on the cross. I'm not going to list it out because I've been you know, sharing it in the last few uh, classes last uh, week as well. But we share in all of the benefits that, you know, Christ has accomplished for us on the cross, uh, does not, which does not make us deity. We don't become God, but God is deity. Uh, we just benefit of what uh, from what Christ has accomplished for us on the cross, and all that Christ has accomplished for the uh, for us on the cross. You know, Paul lists it out or conveys it to us in chapters five, six, and seven. So we uh, uh, you know experience the full benefits of the cross. He says we also share in his righteousness because he has become righteousness to us and he says we share in his authority because he raised us up and and seated us with the father and hence we are co-heirs uh, with uh, Christ Jesus we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ Jesus in the latter part of verse 17 he says if indeed we suffer for with him that we may also be glorified together. So it says, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So what does it mean here? So it says, we suffer with him that we may also be glorified together. So even if we suffer, 
or we go through the sufferings in the flesh, in the world that we are living in, the fallen, corrupted world that we will look at in a, in, in a few verses uh, that uh, Paul is writing uh, 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 below, you know, uh, he says that even if we suffer, we know that we would be glorified, okay? Uh, because why will we glorified? You know, because we are heirs of God and uh, joint heirs with Christ Jesus. So, what is the suffering that Paul is mentioning here? The suffering which you know he's also he's already mentioned in verse thirteen, which is to put to dead uh, the deeds of the body, and this is the suffering he's mentioning about here. So, what is the suffering he's mentioning here? You know, uh, he's he's uh, is something that he's already spoken of in verse thirteen of the same chapter, uh, chapter eight. He's saying uh, there in verse thirteen, put to de dead. Uh, or put to death the deeds of the body. So we have to put to death the deeds of the body. And, you know, uh, this is a suffering that he's mentioning about here in, in this verse 17, and he calls it a suffering because this is not easy. It's not easy for us, uh, you know, to put to death the deeds of our, uh, uh, the, the evil deeds of our body, the sinful deeds of our body. We struggle, we, uh, we find it very difficult and uh, we suffer with it. And we are sometimes frustrated that, you know, we can't really overcome some of these sinful, uh, uh, you know, uh, evil deeds. And so he's saying that, you know, uh, the sufferings are, uh, uh, is uh, uh, what he has mentioned in verse 13 is uh, putting to death the deeds of our body and he called it suffering because it is not easy. Uh, we also know that people suffer on this earth, they go through persecution, challenges and hardships, um, all of those sufferings but the suffering in verse 13 uh, is what he's mentioning here is uh, in verse 17 as well is to put to death the deeds of the Body. Now, just as a cross reference, I would like us to look at First uh, Peter chapter four, uh, verses one and two. First uh, Peter chapter four, verses one and two. It says, "Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin." that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. So here Paul is refer Peter sorry, is referring to a different kind of suffering. He's talking about suffering in the flesh that causes us to cease from uh, sin. And he says, you know, uh, look at Jesus, how he suffered. So you must also be willing to suffer. So in this case, in First Peter chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, he's talking about suffering uh, because you are ceasing from uh, sin. So, uh, but in Romans chapter 8, verse 17, you know, one of the aspects of suffering is putting to death the deeds of the flesh so that we can cease from sin. But Paul adds that if we suffer, we know that we will also be glorified too together. So this putting to death the deeds of the body is going to only cause us to be glorified together, uh, to walk in the glory of being an heir of God and joint heirs with Christ Jesus. Okay, so how do we walk uh, in this glory? You know, uh, okay, we are heirs of God, and joint hairs with Christ, and this is a very glorious position, but how do we walk in this glory? It says, if we suffer, we will be glorified together. So, um, we're saying this in this immediate context, of course, you know, uh, there is uh, there is future glory that we will all enjoy, but here we see that if we suffer, we will also be glorified uh, together. So for us, you know, uh, we are, we have a future hope, we have a future glory, uh, which will be, you know, I'll be explaining uh, uh, in a little bit. Uh, but here he's saying, you know, even if we suffer, we are going to be glorified together. We're going to ex experience uh, that glory uh, in, in a small way, in, in part now, even as we uh, experience the full extent of the glory in the future, which we will enjoy in the future. So for us, 
you know, uh, to walk in the glory of being heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, what do we need to do? We need to put to death the sinful deeds of the uh, body. And uh, Paul is saying, you know, we cannot do it on our own because if we had done it on our own, the law was more than sufficient. But, you know, uh, but because the law was not, uh, had not enabled us to do it, you know, we have the Holy Spirit. The so Holy Spirit is the key, is the one that helps us to put to death the sinful deeds of the uh, body. So we can ask this question, you know, uh, why are believers you know, not able to live as heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, even though we have this glorious position, uh, we have this glorious privilege, this glorious honor we have of being heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ Jesus. Why aren't we as believers able to live as heirs of God and co and joint heirs with Christ? It's because we're not willing to put to death the sinful deeds of the body, which means we're not willing uh, to suffer. Okay, we don't want to suffer, uh, which, which means we don't want to put to death the sinful deeds of the body. Uh, and hence, you know, uh, we are not able to live the life as hairs of God and joint hairs with uh, Christ. So it's a Holy Spirit, you know, who lives in us. Uh, who is the spirit of adoption, uh, who, uh, you know, uh, attests to us or affirms to us that, uh, you know, we are children of God in the spiritual realm. He is the one who makes us hairs of God and joint hairs of Jesus Christ. And it's the Holy Spirit that helps us to overcome the law of sin and death. Uh, he is helping us to overcome the sinful deeds of the body. Uh, he's the one who's leading us because uh, Paul says that, you know, uh, those who are children of God are led by the Spirit of God. Uh, he's also the Spirit of adoption who has brought us into the family. And, uh, you know, he's uh, and uh, gives us uh, this aff uh, affirmation that we are sons and daughters of God. And he's the Holy Spirit is also the one who's bearing witness with our uh, spirit. Um, uh, because of all of this, what the Holy Spirit does, you know, we are hairs of God and joint hairs with Jesus. So in this verse, he's basically talking about, you know, the uh, the work, the person and the work of the uh, Holy Spirit. Okay, And he is also, um, uh, you know, revealing to us uh, the different, um, you know, um, uh, different uh, names of the Spirit here he is uh, for his uh, uh, the different titles of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Life, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Adoption. So you know, beautiful uh, verses which uh, just reveal to us uh, who the Holy Spirit is and what is His work uh, in our uh, lives. Okay, so in the spiritual realm. Our standing. What is uh, you know this? Uh, what is our standing? Our standing is that we are heirs of God and co-heirs with uh, Jesus. And God wants us to conduct our lives. You know the way we live, the way we think, the way we act. Our uh, our, our lives, our, uh, our lifestyles, as heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ uh, in the spiritual realm. Okay. So that is verse 17. Uh, we will move on to verses 18 to verse 23. So can somebody please read verses 18 to verse 23? Before that, anyone has any questions? OK, no questions? Can somebody please read uh, Romans 8, verses 18 to 23, please? Can you read, Pastor? Yes, go ahead, Asha. Future glory, for I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the Son of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willing, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom and the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruit of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoptions as sons, the redemption of our... 
redemption of our body. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Asha. Okay, so this passage is uh, qu uh, quite unique, uh, you know, because what Paul shares here, he does not share anywhere else in any other epistle. So it's a very unique, uh, uh, you know, passage of scripture. And so it's uh, quite important for us to look at uh, these verses and to understand these verses. So verse 18, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth to or worthy to be compared with the glory which will be revealed in us. So he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, uh, which he's actually here not referring to the evil deeds of the body, but here he's referring to the corruption and the bondage of creation, um, which he is, you know, talking about in the, uh, in the following verses in, in verse 19 to verse, um, uh, you know, um, uh, 23. Okay, so here the suffering that he's talking about, the suffering of this present time, he's referring to the corruption and the bondage of uh, creation. So he's pointing also to our future glory. He's saying we are going through earthly suffering, uh, you know, uh, uh, now. Part of it uh, is a suffering that he has also all, already mentioned for us in the preceding uh, verses, which has to uh, do with crucifying the flesh, uh, the suffering that he has spoken about in the preceding verses about um, putting to death the deeds of our body. Uh, but he's saying, you know, um, yes, uh, we will experience a glory, some of the glory in part right now, but there is something more glorious coming up. Okay, and in verse 19, he says, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. So, just like, um, uh, you know, each one of us as children of God are waiting for, uh, you know, and are looking forward for that glorious resurrection of our bodies from being mortal to be changed to immortality, you know, just fleeing all the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the sufferings of the evil desires of our flesh and, and the sickness and, and corruption uh, uh, that is caused and decay and corruption that is caused in our body because of uh, sin, because uh, the law of, uh, uh, because the law of sin, the law of death is at work in our body. And so what is the law of death? You know, that brings decay and corruption and uh uh, you know, uh, degeneration of uh, the, of our body. And, you know, as human beings who are waiting for that uh, and looking up for that for, uh, for that glorious uh, hope, the glorious time when our bodies will be, uh, you know, be changed from, uh, from mortality to being immortal, uh, to be set free from the power of sin and death, and, um, you know, to be in this, uh, the glorious presence of the King of uh, King. So he says, even creation, you know, is eagerly waiting for the unveiling of the sons of God. So we are already sons of God. Uh, we are already heirs, uh, and we are already joint heirs. Um, that is something that is already complete, it is done, but there is something more that is coming up, and even creation is looking forward for that. I'll explain more uh, in detail. I'm just uh, looking at these verses and then we'll come to what all of these uh, uh, verses really mean. Verse 20 says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. So all creation, because of the fall, because when Adam and Eve sinned, you know, was subjected to futility, means uh, to the vain, futile things that are destructive. And that is why if you look at creation now, you know, it's in a total rampage, total destruction because of um, um, not only um, uh, uh, that creation was subjected to futility uh, uh, or to destruction because of the Adam's sin, because of the fall, but also because we have not been good stewards uh, of God's creation. Hence, we're seeing cloud bursts and we're seeing, uh, you know, uh, flooding in various parts of the world and there is earthquakes that's just in the last 
couple of days, we've seen so much of mass uh, destruction uh, in the world around us, and all because of uh, the environmental changes and the climate changes. And now people are very concerned about it because of the ma ma the 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 amount of destruction, the mass scale of destruction that it's bringing about. And so one of the reasons is uh, is also because you know uh, creation was subject to futility when adam and eve sinned even you know creation was uh, had moved from its original design intent purpose uh, that god created it to be it went on a downward spiral okay so um, and we see here that you know it's uh, uh, it says here for the creation was subject to futility not willingly but because of him who subjected it in hope, which means a him here is a capital H and it's talking about God and God let it be subjected okay, to futility, to the vain things. Why? Because this was a choice of man and, uh, you know, um, it not willingly means this was not God's will. This was not God's original intent. It was not his original plan. It was not his original uh, uh, purpose. Uh, but, you know, for this to happen. But note here that God did it willingly. Uh, he, sorry, he did not do it willingly. Uh, but, you know, he allowed creation to be subject uh, to uh, subject uh, to be subjected to vain things, to destruction, to futility. Why did he allow it? You know, uh, he allowed it uh, in the hope that one day he is going to restore all things back to its original purpose and uh, design to what he had intended it to uh, be. And so Paul says that God allowed creation to be subject to futility, uh, to these vain things that are destructive. Uh, why did he allow it? He allowed it because it was not willingly that he did it. It was not his will, but he allowed it because this was man's choice. Okay. So we can ask the question, so if it was man's choice, God is sovereign, he does what he will, so why did he even will to give into man's choice, you know, uh, give into man's choice? It's because, you know, when God created Adam and Eve, he gave them uh, dominion over the earth. Okay? He gave them dominion of the, over the earth. They were rulers of the earth. They were supposed to do, have dominion and subdue the evil one. But when Adam and Eve sinned, they gave over the authority to Satan. And hence we see that everything went, uh, you know, it was a downfall. Uh, everything went downwards and everything lost its purpose and design. Not only, create, not only man uh, uh, and not only sin and death came, but even creation, uh, you know, uh, was subjected to the fall in terms of, uh, you know, uh, being vain and uh, futile and things that were uh, destructive, okay? But God is saying here that he subjected it in hope, you know, uh, he's saying that I'm letting go of this, you know, I'm letting go of this creation that I created uh, with such purpose, with such, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, with order and uh, with such design and such fine tuning, you know, uh, I'm letting it go in the hope uh, uh, the, uh, in the anticipation of the future hope that, you know, I will restore all things back to its original state. I will reinstate everything uh, that has been corrupted, that has gone through degradation, okay? So all of us, you know, we are redeemed. We are the redeemed people of God. We are the children of God. Uh, we are heirs of God. Uh, so we are redeemed, but we are redeemed in part, okay? We are just experiencing part of the eternal life. Like I said, it's an eschatological hope. Uh, eternal life is something that we will experience in the full, in the future, but it's also a realized eschatology in the sense that we will we are re realizing uh, uh, the eternal life, the zoe life, the God kind of life, the fullness of life in part here and um, now. Okay, so we are redeemed in part, but there will be a time when we will experience the full redemption when our bodies will experience uh, the full redemption, uh, you know, when Jesus comes again, okay? Verse 21, it says, because the creation itself also will be delivered from bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So the future time, you know, creation will be also released from the bondage of uh, 
uh, corruption. So in the present moment, uh, creation now is under bondage of corruption, under destruction, degradation. Uh, but even as, you know, uh, that we have this hope uh, where he says, you know, the great liberty uh, or, or redemption that the children of God will experience when our bodies will be redeemed from being mortal to being immortal, in the same way, creation will also be brought back or reinstated to its original position, design, and perfectness with God created it. Okay, amen to that. Okay, so uh, we have this glorious liberty as children of God that uh, we will experience full redemption uh, when our bodies will be redeemed from being mortal to immortal to being immortal and in the same way you know creation will also be brought back or reinstated to its original perfection and design and uh, i mean it's just going to be something glorious uh, that uh, we see we will see and experience um, you know creation in all its beauty and all its design even now when we look at you know creation when we see pictures of you know uh, landscapes of uh, mountain regions waterfalls uh, you know uh, such beauty and grandeur of god's uh, of god's wisdom and uh, his creativity and his imagination you know uh, just uh, just we stand in awe of it uh, but just imagine when everything comes to its perfection, how much more of God's perfection of his creation that we will see and that we will uh, enjoy. Like, you know, when uh, when we when I uh, go from India uh, to visit my sisters who live abroad, you know, just the, you can just feel the change in the atmosphere itself. The air that we breathe is so fresh. It's so uh, refreshing. Uh, and, uh, you know, just thinking of how it will be uh, when Jesus comes and ushers in the millennium kingdom and uh, how it will be in heaven. I mean, uh, what a glorious uh, uh, place, you know, uh, what a glorious experience uh, just to have. Uh, even as now we go and see some breathtaking views of God's creation, just breathe that fresh air into our lungs. Uh, you know, moving away from uh, a city with concrete, uh, a concrete jungle city to, you know, places with such beauty, just feeling the freshness of the air and uh, the seeing the beauty of God's creation just, you know, enlightens us. It just makes us feel so good, uh, refreshes us, um, you know, just imagine how it will be when, when all of creation be reinstated to its original position. In verse 22, we see that, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. So even as we are suffering, even creation because of the fall is going through uh, such pain and, you know, compares it to that uh, pain of a woman in labor. It, it is intense pain, but, you know, uh, uh, but the woman in labor knows that even as she goes through this intense pain, it'll, it's going to give birth to something beautiful, someone beautiful, to someone that is going to just a very look at that, that little baby's uh, face uh, will just kind of, you know, just diminish all the the struggle, the pain, the suffering the mother has gone through just to hold the baby, just to see the baby in her arms, to see the face of the baby. In the same way, you know, even as creation is going through all this pain and the suffering, you know, but uh, it also has, it's looking for that future hope. Uh, it's anticipating, it is expecting something wonderful to uh, happen. Verse 23, not only that, but we also who have the have the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. So it says not only that, but we who are the first fruits of the spirit. So here the first fruits of the spirit, he's talking about believers. <clears throat> Sorry. He's talking about believers um, in whom the Holy Spirit dwells, the first fruits of the Spirit. Here, if you see, it's a capital S, so it's not talking about human spirit, but talking about the Holy Spirit. He's And the first fruits are, you know, he's talking about believers, those who have accepted the Lord Jesus, in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. He says, even we who are believers, we are groaning. Why are we groaning? Because we are suffering. 
what are we suffering with? He's already mentioned in verse 13, you know, uh, the sinful deeds of our body. And here he's also mentioning in uh, verse 18, he's mentioned to us uh, the sufferings of, uh, you know, because we are living in a fallen world, um, uh, because uh, there is, uh, uh, we're living in a world where there is decay, there's corruption, uh, uh, you know, uh, where everything is not perfect. Uh, so he says, we too are groaning, we too are suffering, and we too are eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. So in verse 21, Paul mentions the glorious liberty of the children of God. And he's referring to the time of the redemption of our bodies, when our body will be fully and completely redeemed in the sense that mortal will put on immortality and we will no longer be subjected to a physical death uh, and to sin. So what is Paul uh, basically telling us in this passage um, from verses 18 um, uh, right up to verse 23 is that when Adam sinned, you know, not only did Adam come into subjection of sin and Satan, and as a consequence of that death, but the whole world, all of creation, came into the subjection of sin, Satan, and degradation or death, corruption, decay. So all of creation at the fall, you know, uh, came into bondage, into corruption. It came into a uh, subjection of the working of uh, uh, the law of death, which is decay. Uh, there was uh, there was a downward decline. There was a deviation from its original uh, design, and this is not uh, you know this was not God's original design, or this is not how He created the world. Uh, we see tornadoes, hurricanes. We see mass flooding that is happening. Uh, we see volcanoes erupting, uh, earthquakes. Uh, unusual um, phenomenon like you know uh, countries in Europe are having uh, summers which uh, are high soaring temperatures which they have never experienced uh, uh, you know rainfall cloud bursts that is causing landslides uh, mass destru uh, destruction of places and uh, this was not all what God created you know we can't blame this on God this was not his original design uh, this is not how he created the world. This was not his purpose. But why do we see all of this happening? It partly is because of sin, uh, sin that uh, uh, you know, sin uh, uh, and the fall that brought corruption and deviation from the original uh, design and purpose, um, and the perfect state that God had created it to be. Also, we can't you know say everything is happening because of this of sin and the and fall of uh, uh, adam and eve but also it's because we are not being good stewards of uh, uh, of uh, of the things that god has entrusted to us good stewards of the earth good stewards of plants and trees and how we use the natural resources that we have so why is there uh, the suffering in the world today uh, you know, you know. Not only do we see that there is suffering in this world today in terms of uh, all of these natural calamities, but we also see there's a lot of other sufferings in terms of you know children born with uh, you know birth defects, um, partly because of genes uh, that they inherited. Also, because you know we live in a in a world that is um, uh, corrupted. There's so much of um, sickness and disease, and everything is because creation is under. Uh, corruption and bondage and God allowed this you know uh, not willingly but he allowed this because it was a choice that man had made uh, but he allowed it also with the future hope of the glorious redemption it's a, a time when he will you know bring back reinstate everything back to its glorious uh, uh, position uh, to the perfection that he created it just as all of us will be redeemed into the glorious body that he created us to be. You know, he created us to be like him without sin, uh, without, uh, you know, uh, God created us never to die. God created us never to sin. Um, he gave us a mind uh, to understand him, to uh, comprehend, to perceive uh, the mind of God. And we will all be redeemed back to that original uh, position. How do we sustain the hope 
of the future glorious redemption in a believer uh, we will look at it uh, in in the in the following verses so we'll answer that if not uh, if you are not happy with the answer then i will uh, i will add in something more is that okay elisha Okay, so um, uh, let's look at a few cross references. Um, Colossians chapter one verse twenty. Can somebody please read Colossians chapter one verse twenty? And someone else can turn to Ephesians chapter one verse fourteen, please. And uh, can uh, any one of you read Colossians one twenty? And anyone else can read uh, Ephesians chapter one verse fourteen, please. I can read uh, Colossians 120. Yes, thank you, Kung. Right. Colossians 120. And through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ, Christ's blood on the cross. Thank you. Uh, so here we see that what is you know God working towards? What is the hope or the glorious a hope that he has, which he subjected uh, creation to its futility, but what is the hope that he has and what is he working towards is through Christ. He's going to reconcile all things to himself. Okay, so he's going to bring everything all back to himself, uh, but now he let it go, not willingly, as we read in Romans 8, um, so that, you know, what Jesus did on the cross, uh, you know, um, he will reconcile all things back to himself. So God had this future hope that, you know, when Jesus dies on the cross, he will reconcile everything, things on earth, uh, things in heaven, will be made peace through the blood of his cross. Okay. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 14. Can I read, Pastor? Yes, please, Asha. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory? Thank you. So here we see that the Holy Spirit has been given to us as a deposit, as a guarantee, uh, until, okay, which means that there is more to come, okay. Uh, you know, uh, he's the guarantee of an inheritance, uh, that we are the redeemed possession or the purchased possession of God. And it's the Holy Spirit that has been given to us as a deposit, as a guarantee, uh, reminding us of our inheritance, uh, that we are, you know, uh, the, uh, the purchased possession of God because we have been redeemed by the blood of uh, Jesus. Uh, and also, you know, there is more to come. This is not just what it is uh, for us, but there is more to come. Um, you know, it says, until the redemption of the purchased possession. So we are partly redeemed, but we will be fully redeemed. Like, you know, I said, when our mortal bodies will be changed to immortal ones. So the rede redemption, you know, until the redemption of the purchased uh, position. So there is uh, more to come. And that is what the Holy Spirit is, uh, you know, testifying to us, is assuring us that he, you know, and he's a, he's our deposit, he's our guarantee. And he's saying, you know, we have received this, but there is something more to come. And what is that? You know, we are partly redeemed now, but we will be fully redeemed. So coming back to uh, Romans chapter 8, um, uh, you know, looking at these verses from 18 to 23, it says, we suffer in this world and we wonder, you know, why? It's because of all of creation is subject to corruption and decay. Uh, but there is a hope. There is this glorious liberty of the children of God uh, that even as we have experienced redemption in our body in part now, we will experience it in full in the future. Uh, and also this hope that God will redeem all things, all things in creation, uh, and uh, all things in each one of us, you know, he will redeem it back to himself, to its original position, to its original glory and grandeur, and uh, to the way that he purposed and uh, designed it, okay? Uh, so we'll just move ahead, uh, looking at verses uh, 24 to um, 28. So can somebody read that, please? 24 to 28. Pastor Kennedy. Yeah, sure, Sri Kumar. Thank you. And this hope is what we say, what saves us. 
But if we already have what we hope for, there is no need to keep on hoping. However, we hope for something we have not yet seen and we patiently wait for it. In certain ways, we are weak, but the spirit is here to help us. For example, when we don't know what to pray for, the spirit prays for us in ways that cannot be put into words. All of our thoughts are known to God. He can understand what is in the mind of the spirit as a spirit prays for God's people. We know that God is always at work for the good, for the good of everyone who loves him. They are the ones God has chosen for his purpose. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Sikh. So here is Paul saying we have this hope of the redemption of all things uh, 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 you know, in creation and also our bodies, which he has spoken about. And he says, but hope that is seen is not hope. You know, we cannot see hope. And that is why it is hope. You know, if we see it, then there is no need for us to hope for it. But because we cannot see, uh, that is why we have hope. Now, hope is something uh, we have, you know, we look for something that's going to happen in the future. And all we can do for it is, uh, you know, wait patiently uh, in endurance and perseverance. So, uh, like Elijah asked, you know, how do we sustain the hope of the glorious redemption uh, in the believer? One of the things is, you know, uh, we just uh, put our faith and trust uh, and the hope of what we have already received. You know, uh, like what he already has uh, listed out to us, uh, you know, in Romans chapter 5, 6 and 7, you know, the full benefits of the cross that we have received because of what Jesus has done on the cross. He has enlisted so many uh, uh, blessings, uh, spiritual blessings that we have rece will receive, the physical blessings. Uh, we also have uh, the Holy Spirit that uh, who indwells in us. And we've also seen the the, the work of the Holy Spirit in in our lives. So, how do we sustain ourselves in hope? Is uh, is we look at uh, you know uh, what God has given to us, and why Paul is writing out all of these things and enlisting all of these things. He said because he's basically telling the uh, the Jews, you know, don't look just at the law and the and the circumcision ritual. You know, uh, keeping that is not going to actually, uh, you know, uh, do anything much to you because he, he talks about what is the role of the law and how um, it's just a kind of, um, you know, uh, highlights sin for us, but it's not something that empowers us, uh, you know, uh, to keep. Uh, the law and uh, and also he talks about circumcision he says you look at uh, Abraham you know he talks about Abraham in chapter 4 and he says Abraham was not justified by faith uh, you know because he did the circumcision ritual before the circumcision ritual the, the sign of the covenant was given to him you know he uh, uh, he uh, uh, was justified or he was called righteous by faith uh, because he believed in Jesus Christ so it's your faith so what do we do to sustain the hope of the uh, you know this future glorious redemption in a believer is to put our faith in all that God has done for us on the cross what Christ has accomplished for us on the cross we need to live by that we need to uh, we need to establish the student fact that we are dead to sin that you know because we are dead to sin we can't sin anymore you know and uh, sin has no longer dominion so all of these truths are not supposed to just be in, in, in the word of God, but these truths need to enlighten us. We need to live these truths. These need to become a reality. And also we need to recognize the role and the work of the Holy Spirit, fellowship with him, uh, because he is the one who testifies to us. He's the one who reminds us. He's the one who enables us. He's the key to help us to overcome the sinful deeds of our uh, body. And here, you know, uh, Paul is uh, saying, you know, how, how can can we, uh, you know, wait in anticipation for this future hope? He says, you know, uh, uh, all we can do is wait for it in patient endurance and perseverance. So we could we go through sufferings, and he's talked about different kinds of sufferings, uh, sufferings which he mentions about uh, the evil deeds of our body. Uh, the second suffering is because of he's mentioned here in these verses was. Um, 
you know, 18 onwards is to 23 is talking about the corruption in this and the destruction in this world. Okay, we all go through suffering. Okay, uh, but what do we do? We don't give up. You know, uh, we we fight. We stand. Uh, we put on the armor of God. We stand and we fight because He's given us everything we need for life and godliness. And the Holy Spirit is there in us, enabling us uh, and helping us. He's the key. And all we need to do is, uh, you know, to be patient uh, 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 and endure and persevere, and to live conscious of what Christ has called us to, who we are. Uh, like I just mentioned, that we are hairs of God you know, co has which means that, you know, we uh, are seated in heavenly places on the right hand of uh, the Father. You know, remember, we talked about our position in Christ Jesus. We are, um, you know, dead. Uh, uh, we are crucified with Christ. We are buried. We are resurrected with him. Uh, you know, we, uh, uh, we ascended with him and we're also seated with him, the right hand of the Father. So this is our position. So we take hold of our position. We speak. Uh, to our situations, we speak uh, to our authority because uh, the uh, you know we're living in the spiritual dimension of the kingdom of God. The, the kingdom of God is in us, and through us, you know, the power and the authority that God has given to us, it uh, it uh, uh, you know uh, it um, uh, permeates, it penetrates into the situations and the places that uh, we go through. So we are not dominated by situations, but we dominate situations that happen in our life. How do we do it? By speaking uh, God's word, by using the authority that he has uh, given to us. And uh, we stand our ground and fight. And that is why Paul even says, you know, uh, you know, sometimes we need to be like childlike in our faith where uh, we just trust God and receive everything. But sometimes, you know, uh, Satan withholds uh, the blessings that Christ has accomplished for us on the cross. And what do we do that uh, do at those times? Uh, we don't let, just remain childlike and wait for God to. We need to, you know, be militant in our spirit. We need to be aggressive in our spirit. We need to, you know, uh, take back what is ours. And for that, we need to be militant and aggressive uh, and violent in our spirit because the kingdom of God suffers violent and the violent violence and the violent take it by force. So some of the things, you know, that God has already given to us, we need to uh, know what it is and we need to take it because it is ours. And sometimes we need to press in, fight in, uh, the demonic forces and God has given us every weapon that we need and um, you know uh, and that is how we can sustain this hope that we have uh, the future uh, glorious redemption of our body and also put our hope and trust yes there is a future hope you know all our present sufferings is going to do away with and we have this future hope okay so in verse um, uh, was 26. Uh, interestingly, uh, you know, Paul transitions into prayer, and we will talk about this in our class on Friday. Okay. So, did I uh, help answer your question, Elisha? Yes, no. Anyone has any questions? Any questions anyone has? Okay, if not, we'll end class. Thank you all for joining. And yes, Elisha? Sorry, we uh, do not hear you. Thank you, Kung. Thank you, Asha. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Siddhant. Thank you so much.